Hi, my name is Dr. Justin Massey. Today we're going to get a lesson on uh, Janine Roof's Chanson and Passepied. I'm going to focus mostly on the saxophone part. Um, so let's kick it off. Here is uh, just a quick recording of me playing uh, this piece start to finish uh, just with the saxophone part. So let's start with the chanson. Let's look at the very first phrase. You'll notice that we start mezzo piano, we crescendo, and we have an eighth rest. So this eighth rest, it's not actually dividing, splitting up the phrase. It's all one four bar phrase. So we want to really practice blowing through that eighth rest. And what I recommend doing, what I do personally, is I practice this and I use a dotted chord or actually get rid of the eighth rest completely, just like this. After I play that a few times that way, I'll put the eighth rest back in, really focusing on not breathing, but maintaining the energy while I have that silence in there.
the composer really helps us out there by drawing a crescendo through the rest. So obviously we can't physically crescendo while we're resting, so you really need to think of a crescendo of intensity as opposed so that we can really truly have this four bar phrase while we're still while we're still uh, crescendoing. And the same goes for all, all of these little eighth note rests really in this piece. We have one, the first rest that's actually the conclusion of a phrase is after those three repeated Bs. Also, you might wanna ask yourself, well, how do we play those three notes when they're tied over but still have a staccato on them? For me, I really like to have just a little bit of bounce but still a nice legato articulation. I almost think of a bouncing ball because we also have that decrescendo there so it's like each bounce of the ball is a little less and so I really like to in terms of intensity have it be intent the most intense level one and then level two level three which each of those getting softer and softer so that concludes the first couple of phrases we really just need to um, go through the eighth rest and really kind of highlight the shape it goes starts from a low B goes to a high B the next phrase starts on a B goes to that high A and so we really get an arc effect the next phrase we all of a sudden get subito mezzo forte and it's on kind of a tricky wonky note on the saxophone um, so that C sharp we often need to have our octave key and finger three down in order to raise it up if you just take a listen here's C sharp normally and then I'm going to add my octave key plus my third finger So this is a naturally a flat note on saxophones. So we have to raise it up. You do have to be aware though, if you're playing a Selmer Series 3, um, and there might be a couple other saxophones that have a vent there, you might have to use side A, your side B flat and side C keys. Because adding octave key plus your third finger on a Selmer Series 3 will actually, actually further drop the pitch. So just play with the tuner and really see if you can get that C sharp in tune. Now we're bouncing between C sharp and E. E with the octave key, just like D and D sharp, these are all really sharp notes. So we're going flat note, sharp note, flat note, sharp notes. So we really have to practice with the tuner. And there's a couple other tricks. When we have middle D, middle D sharp, and middle E, we can put our low B key down. And this is gonna drop those pitches. And again, so I'll play the pitch regular, and then I'll play the pitch with the added B. So this is a, a, a our D, a saxophone D. There's a huge difference in pitch. So keep this in mind, D, D sharp, E, and this goes back to the first, second phrase, every single note you see in Chanson Passepier, every note that you see with some middle D in any saxophone literature, we're going to have to address the sharpness of our instrument. So going back to this third phrase, we have that subito mezzo forte. Really go for it. We're in unison with the piano. The piano's also moving quarter notes with us. So it has to be confident. It has to be energetic in order to kind of make sense. Obviously, don't start too loud because we have to crescendo to a forte, which is the peak of the chanson, is this forte coming up on that A. So just think mezzo forte, but think full, think large. Don't think maybe aggressive and powerful. Now, I know I said before in the previous, in the beginning phrase, two phrases, that we have to blow through the eighth note to connect the phrase. Here, I will actually breathe at that eighth note before the forte because I want to make sure I have enough air to sustain that forte. And it's a long, long um, descend to that F sharp decrescendoing. So I will actually breathe and I'll practice those phrases with the intensity of the breath, not disrupting the flow of the phrase.
So again, there, and if you want to practice, I, I would totally practice not putting in a breath there to get used to connecting the phrase and seeing if you can make it sound the exact same once you put the breath back in. So here it is once where I take that uh, quarter tied to an eighth and make it into a half note. <laughs> Again, that gives me the sense of continuity so that I can work on having it with the breath in there. The key is to practice the breath. Okay, a lot of students just think breathing, oh, it's easy, it's natural, it's what we do all the time instinctively. Yes, it is what we do instinctively, but this is a different kind of breathing, musical breathing, phrasing. Um, so if you isolate just the bar before, the bar after that rest and practice it over and over, you're going to get used to the breathing and it's going to make you have successful phrases. It's going to sound like you're a professional musician. Finally, um, just a quick note that throughout all of the notes I've been playing so far, I've just been holding down my B key for all those middle range notes. Okay, and when I start the phrase at mezzo forte with C, the C sharp, I actually just hold down my B key for the entire phrase until I get to that A. That way, I'm not going to forget it doesn't make excessive clicks and doesn't require excessive movement on the saxophone. We have mechanisms in place that make sure that it's not closing down any extra keys. To end this phrase, this chanson, okay, we get kind of a combination of these two ideas. The very first phrase and the phrase that starts with the C sharp. So we want to make sure that these two B's at the very end, we have those octaves. Practice going in between them, crescendoing and decrescendoing with the tuner. So that they're both right dead center on the tuner. So initially, my low B flat was a little low, my high B flat was a little high, and so I just had my tuner on and I was working those octaves to get used to them being the same. What I had to do for my low B, that middle B on the saxophone, was add my side B flat key. It raises that pitch up. And then as I de decrescendo that final B, the tendency of the saxophone is to go high. So the pitch will go up. So to counter that, I can either try to move my embouchure or because it's, you know, soft, delicate, it might be a little difficult to maintain the sound while we do that, I can just half hole my right hand. So I'm slowly going to close my fingers four, five, and six as I decrescendo to keep that pitch really, really steady. Again, do some long tones with the tuner. Find out where is too much. Where does the pitch change? Where does it drop? So that we can have a seamless, steady pitch with really smooth fingers. Okay. One final thing to do is while you're practicing this piece, we're obviously going to practice without an accompanist, without a pianist, just like I'm doing here. So make sure you take a look at the piano score and listen along with recording so that you know what the piano is doing with you. It's really important to know that in the first two measures of the chanson that the pianist has the melody. It makes it far easier to count our rest and to really know how our entrance fits in. One final thing, you'll notice that some of the harmonies, 
the piano for the most part moves in quarter notes or with some eighth notes in there. And sometimes we're going to have a clash. We're going to have a semitone clash and you really have to embrace those clashes, that dissonance so that when it resolves, it's really beautiful. Okay. In one, two, three, the fourth measure of the melody that we play, so measure six, our D natural, which is a concert F, clashes with the E natural in the piano and then resolves at the end of the phrase. So it's really important to know when the piano has the melody, how your part fits in. For example, at C sharp mezzo forte, we're in unison, we're doing the same thing as the piano. So we want to look at our pianists, make sure that we're having this dialogue with them, both musically, but also when we rehearse with them, when we speak with them, um, to make your rehearsal experience just go really smoothly. Because um, of course you're paying the pianist, you want to make sure that you're using the most of your time out of your time and that you have a successful audition or concert performance. So the main things, if we just review the chanson quickly, is to make sure that we have the correct phrasing, that those rests don't interrupt or break up and make short those phrases. They're minimum four bar phrases, sometimes we have even longer, that last phrase starting in that mezzo forte, going to that forte, decrescendoing down. We have to breathe, but we can't break the phrase. So again, it's to practice by erasing the rests, filling it in, and practicing with a long kind of form, long form phrase. And then of course the other thing, which is just so evident in slower beautiful music, is our intonation. So making sure that that middle C sharp on the saxophone isn't flat, that we use corrective fingerings to raise it up, and our middle D, D sharp, and E aren't too high, and we put a low B key down to actually bring that pitch down to center. So practice this with the tuner, have a separate tuner, on your stand. Um, that way you can see the tendencies of the saxophone. And of course, do some long tones with all of these pitches. Put on a drone. Um, for example, if I just put on a drone um, on concert, on the first note, concert D, and just practice a little bit with it. practice those open harmonies. Then I might want to put the drone on a, on a concert A, on the second note that we have. If I'm starting that third phrase, I want to put our drone on an E, Concert E, R, C sharp. So that I can practice these harmonies, practice these notes in tune, so that I'm ready for that first rehearsal with the piano. So let's go to the passe-pied now. We have 3-8 time, this dance-like feel. So the very first thing I want to bring your attention to are the notes. Because even though it looks different rhythmically, if I take these notes out of context, the very first notes that we, the saxophone plays in the passe-pied, you'll notice the melody sounds pretty familiar. It's the beginning of the melody. It's the same melody, but now we're taking a different rhythmic and stylistic approach to it. So to make sure, the, the hardest part about this rhythm, in, in my opinion, is going to be all the ties over the bar lines. We often don't feel where beat one is. Be a bum bum ba dum bum ba da di da di da dum. So the very first thing I would do is break the ties, rearticulate the A going over the bar line, the B going over the bar line, so we get used to the rhythm. 
And then we can start to internalize that feeling of the downbeat so that we don't need to articulate it. So we're still counting in our head, we're feeling that boom of the bass of the downbeat. So obviously practicing with the metronome is going to be really, really helpful here. Also, a really good reason to practice with the metronome, I tend to take this movement, this part of the piece, way too fast. So you can set it to 60, or we can 60 with triplets, or just put your um, 60 times 3 would be 180 to have the feeling of the eighth note. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, mm. So that way I can practice with really, really good, good rhythm and practice breaking those ties with the metronome on. Put those ties back in. And of course, I'm taking a big step forward here and I'm practicing right at the written tempo. You might want to slow those notes down a little bit. Slow down that metronome. Practice good rhythm with good technique. It's going to depend where you are in your own technical practice and how slow you need to go, how frequently um, you return back to that slow tempo to really work on the technique and work on the bass rhythms. But I always recommend slow practice. You know, as before the metronome was on, I was going much, much slower turn the metronome on, all of a sudden I was back in the tempo of the piece. So with a dance style comes lightness, and you'll notice that there's a lot of staccato notes all over the place. So the thing about staccato, we don't, end, we don't need to end the note with our tongue. It's not a dot articulation. We let the air do the work. <laughs> a little burst of air, and that's going to take care of, the, note, the end of the note will take care of itself. We do a push from the abdominal wall. <laughs> So remember, when we breathe in, we put air into our lungs, our stomach expands, and then we can use our core to actually pull the air out of us. Or you can think of pulling the air out, or this pushes the air out. And so I like to just put a finger up to my mouth and sizzle that air. We really should be able to do it without using our tongue. So if I take that first F-sharp staccato, and then add the tongue in for precision. So for me, it's dynamic air that we have to use to get the energy of the dance, this true stylistic feeling of the Paspier. So I always think dynamic air to get a nice light articulation. The air is doing the work. The tongue is there for precision, okay? So throughout all of these staccatos, I wanna jump forward a little bit, um, where we get the dia, dia, yum, bum, where we slur into a staccato. So a staccato is helping us define the length of a note. We often say a short note, maybe not the best separated is much better, is a much better way to define staccato. So when we slur into a staccato, we really have to focus on the end of the note as the release of the note. So that way a staccato that's slurred in, if we have the energy of the air, we still get the energy of the staccato. 
So remember, it's really good to practice, sometimes without the tongue, to really get those releases. Now put the tongue back in, have the same energy of the air. And here we're crescendoing poco a poco, but I really also like to think we have this kind of idea, three sets of the same idea, ba da dum ba da dum bum and then we have that again. And so every time we have those ideas, we can actually do stair dynamics. I find that really, really exciting. It gives a little more energy, a little more anticipation every time we increase our dynamic range. And once we get to this decrescendo, uh, not decrescendoing, this descending 16th note line, which often gives us a lot of um, trouble in the technique of the saxophone, for the most part, it's a chromatic scale, except for that D sharp to C sharp, the very first note, and then we kind of reset. So it's the same thing in two different octaves. So practice two bars at a time. I like to circle the sets of notes that aren't chromatic. That way, I, just, I know, I can look at it and quickly realize, yes, this part isn't chromatic. Because guess what? We have this, when it comes back at the end of the piece, it's fully chromatic. So we have to make sure we can really quickly differentiate, yes, this is the one we have, we have that step, step, D sharp, C sharp, B. And then we have later on in the chromatic. And one other thing to take a note, I lied a little bit, that second octave is almost the same, but you'll notice it starts at D-sharp, C-sharp, B in the high octave, in measure three of this 16th note line, line it's D-flat, E-flat, D-flat, C natural. So it is slightly different, we just gotta watch out that for that extra accidental. So again, we have kind of the same thing, be a yum. After this descending line, the piano has the melody. So it makes it a lot easier to count. It has that twice. So really make sure you take a look. And, you know, if you're not reading from the, if you don't have, say, an iPad to read from, you might have to make notes in the, sac the paper saxophone score. If you have an iPad or you have the ability to read from the score and manage your turn pages, I would just read from the score. That way we get to you know, have the luxury of seeing what the pianist has. It makes it a lot easier to count, a lot easier to follow, and a lot easier to see how the saxophone part fits into the piano. If you don't have that, if you're just using the saxophone part, write in kind of like a reduced version of what the piano is doing. You don't need to write in the exact notes, but you might want to write the rhythm. Be like, oh yes, this is the rhythm of the melody. The pianist has the melody during this rest. Yeah. So then we have these five staccato notes, and then followed by that same kind of idea of that stepwise motion where we can step up those dynamics all the way from piano up to forte. Then we have a style shift. We're still in 3-8 time. We're still in this waltz feel, but then we'll get these longer notes. So this is... Um, a lace starting two measures before. Again, we have all these sharp notes, so just leave your B key down. So I'll leave my low B key down until I get to that A going into the B flat, and I release those keys. That way I'm in tune with the piano, even though the piano doesn't play there, in tune with myself. This is where it's really important to practice with a metronome, because we're going from fast notes to slow, longer notes. And again, we sometimes we get slurs or ties over the downbeats, so we want to make sure we 
articulate those much like we did in the beginning. In fact, you can even practice this whole section articulating at the eighth note level. If you don't understand what I mean, you'll hear it. That way we're kind of counting out loud through the saxophone to get us used to counting our rhythms. And then again, put it with the metronome. After we do that, articulate with the metronome and eventually just play the correct rhythms. One note, so we want to have a sostenuto sound. We, we don't have staccatos here, so the air is actually going to be kind of independent of the, the fingers. So what I mean by that is our air is just going to be this constant square. It's like blowing a candle out. <sighs> blowing a candle that's never going to go out. <sighs> and then our fingers move, and it's going to, if, if, even when we move only one note, our fingers move very, very fast and that's gonna create what we call a sostenuto sound. Then we have a little taper at the very end when we have, and we restart a phrase mezzo forte. So it's kind of descends both in terms of um, our range and our dynamics a little bit and then goes back up. So really, I like to put a legato mark over the B flat mezzo fortes um, just to remind myself to restart that phrase strongly. And so it's going to make it very clear for the pianist who's just running 16th notes underneath all of this. Ba da dee da 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 ba da dee da 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 ba da dee da dee da. So again, really good practice with the metronome because the pianist is going to be our metronome here. So we get used to this feeling of 16th notes underneath us. Um, so really just take a look at the dynamics and be um, lyrical here because it's such a different feeling that we're in this super rhythmic world and this waltz world, but yet we can still play this lyrical sostenuto phrase. Then we got the recapitulation. You'll notice it's the same, back to the original melody of the piece, back to the original rhythm of the pass pied, except there's a big difference. Instead of staccatos, we have legatos, and so does the pianist. So now, that was what we had at the beginning. Now we have to lengthen out those eighth notes without losing the energy of the piece. it's forte it's beautiful it's exciting just with the louder dynamic the more um, intense dynamic and that's uh, those tenudos it's gonna naturally should be fairly easy to get that style change okay and again remember it's all about metronome practice to make sure that we don't lose time or get ahead of ourselves because the articulation is different <laughs> So again, we might have to go back and break up those ties to get used to counting. And the pianist is gonna help you because they have one, three, one, three, one, three, two, three, one, three, one, three, one. So we often just say bum, be bum, be a bum, bum. So the pianist is almost articulating for us. You can think of it kind of that way. 
see, we get a lot, all the same notes. So here's the beautiful part is we don't have to relearn the recapitulation. We already have the technique down. So we can focus solely on style. When we get to that mezzo forte, for me, there's staccatos missing because we find we finally see our first staccato at that G sharp. But I like to reference back to the original material at the beginning of the Passepied and put staccatos on all the eighth notes. Here I don't do the stared dynamic increase though because the composer really put that one that crescendo so it's really to start at mezzo forte wait wait be a bum be a bum bum wait be a bum be a bum bum wait be a bum be a ba da dum be da dum be da 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 dum we really have to wait to make that crescendo exciting in fact i even push that crescendo one measure later than it is to give it excitement right up to the d sharp fully chromatic descending line I don't have to think at all because it's fully chromatic. I practice my chromatic scale, so you should totally practice your chromatic scale forwards, backwards, the full range of our instruments in 16th notes, in 6 tuplets, in 3 8, in 6 8 time, so that it's second nature for you to be able to play this. Um, you just write chromatic over top of your that line, and you can instantly look ahead to the very end. When we have a double forte line that descends two octaves, we just have to be careful. We want to maintain that double forte, which actually means crescendoing as we go down. It's just a very natural thing that the lower, um, the lower something is, the less loud our ear perceives it, psychoacoustics. So we actually have to crescendo through this line and really land on that low D sharp with energy and vigor. And then we get, in my opinion, the most exciting part of the piece where we get offbeat articulations, slurs and staccatos, so again, I would practice all of this slowly to make sure I really get the style. So I'm going to put my eighth notes at 120. So starting this forte, starting off beat one, make sure I use side A sharp because we have that chromatic going to the B. Once I'm comfortable, I might go 120, then 132, 136, 144, working my way up to eventually the written tempo. So for me, the energy comes from having the good rhythm, having good articulation that, remember, comes back to air bursts. <laughs> Whenever we have two slurs, we can accent a little bit. Okay? And then when we get to this final, these Bs and G sharps, you notice that the piano, it's really important to look at the piano part because beat one, the pianist has a double forte, a chord with an accent, which means we can add that accent. And they have it again. So we get 
three ser series of accents that aren't written in our part that make a lot of stylistic sense. So be a dum dia dia dum, be a dum dia dia dum, be a dia 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 di. And so then all of a sudden our part meshes with the piano a lot better. <laughs> And for this very last part, the pianist has all the notes that we don't have. So, it, so while we have one, three, two, one, three, one, the pianist has mm, two, one, three, two, one, two. So we, we really hear all the notes. We get one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. To make it very, very clean, let's start by practicing it without the grace notes. From there, I tend to use, I use side B um, A sharp, and I use side F sharp for that very last one. It's a lot easier than trying to do this cross fingering of going four to five. Once we have those accents, those really really quick grace notes, it's just very very exciting. So really make sure that we're going for the style here. So remember, we have the same, when we start the pass we have the same notes, we have the same melody as the chanson, but we have a different style, a different speed, a different time signature, and that's what makes this piece so exciting. Um, so I hope that's a quick crash course uh, lesson in uh, Janine Roof's chanson pass -pied. It's a beautiful piece with different styles in it. It's, I think, a great audition piece. Um, for, for any, any major college program. It's a beautiful piece to play at a recital. Um, I just love to work on it whenever I want to kind of reflect on saxophone sound, on my tone, um, to work on my intonation, to work on my different styles and articulations. So I hope it's a piece that um, you really enjoy playing. Make sure you listen to recordings. Make sure you look at the piano part. And, of course, have fun with it. It's a beautiful song. You should have a lot of fun putting it together, rehearsing it with your accompanist, and ultimately playing it, no matter how high stakes that performance is. Remember, we get to share music. We should be having fun. Thank you so much.